Oh, I see nothing. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. I'm really excited about the content we are coming out with today. Dr. Thomas Schreiner is on the other line with us, and he's going to be talking to us about cessationism. And in particular, we're going to camp out in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, talking about the apostles and prophets as the foundation, and we're going to hang out in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talking about when the perfect comes, the gifts will cease. Uh, one of them, uh, Dr. Schreiner believes, is one of the strongest arguments for cessationists, and the other, Dr. Schreiner believes, is one of the strongest arguments for continuationist. Uh, and if you're watching, those terms are new to you. Uh, just know that the continuationist position is that the gifts of the Spirit that were manifest in the first century are all still active in the church today, and cessationists hold that some of those gifts, uh, in particular the ones that the, uh, that cessationists would call the miraculous gifts, those have ceased uh, after maybe the first, second century, maybe after the close of the canon. Each cessationist is going to come at it from a different perspective. Uh, we'll give Dr. Schreiner a moment to introduce that. But before uh, I uh, introduce Dr. Schreiner, I, I want to let you meet this th this guy right meet right here. Me. Just want to yeah. give them the privilege look at, of meeting Look at that me. face. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, guys, we, well, I, that was just a funny introduction. I'm sorry. I just, I just, I try to make it as uncomfortable uh, as possible. That's cool. That's uh, cool. Just so that, uh, yeah, it just, it's it just works. what you do. Yeah. So uh, I used to be youth pastor. It's what we do. <laughs> so tomorrow, I want to let you guys know what we have coming up, uh, a Q&A. Q&A over the gifts of the Holy Spirit, healing, prophecy, apostleship, yep. uh, casting out demons, doesn't matter. So uh, that is going to be tomorrow. You can see the little graphic there of the cell phones. We prefer videos. Gives you a better chance to get your question asked. Uh, media at the remnant radio dot Com. Com. That's where you want to send it go. in. Yep. That's where you want to send it in. So we'll try to get to all of your questions. Uh, next week, we're talking about Christians and LGBTQ. Uh, we have Lori Craig on the show, and then that'll be on Monday. And then Tuesday, false teaching. And so uh, we want to ask the question, is it okay? And if so, when might it be okay to actually name a false teacher? Yeah. And, and in what spirit do we? How do we do it? What does this look like? And so uh, we, we want to tackle that because you have, you know, discernment ministries, and then you have people who are anti-discernment ministries, and what does it look like to just plain old have discernment? So we're going to kind of walk through that that space together. But without further ado, we want to talk to Dr. Thomas Schreiner back with us. Uh, Dr. Schreiner, such an honor to have you back on the show. Thank you for joining us. Maybe uh, you could just take a moment, introduce yourself to us, tell us a little bit about your, your work, your ministry, and uh, how people can connect with you. So, yeah, I'm Tom Schreiner. Um, I hope I'm not named in the false teaching uh, podcast next week. We have, we have no anticipation. Just depends no, I mean, on how, kidding, depends kidding. On how today's show goes. <laughs> no anticipation. I'm yeah, joking. depends on I'm how. joking. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it, it was great. I was on with you guys a couple weeks ago, and it's, I'm just uh, thrilled to be on with you again today. And... Um, I teach at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I've been there since 1997. So okay. where did all those years go? Did, <laughs> I actually, I was actually just thinking, I, uh, let's see if I get this right again, do the math. I just finished my 38th year of teaching. So. Wow. Excellent. That's Congratulations. Awesome. That's, that's a big accomplishment. Well, yeah, so, ex yep. so excited to have you on the show. And we're just going to jump into these two uh, texts that are so central to the uh, central to deciding this issue, and if you're joining with us, and maybe you're on the fence with continuationism, cessationism, maybe you put yourself into the open but cautious camp. Uh, our goal in this conversation is to really help push you over to one side of the fence. Of course, now Josh and I are on one side of the fence, and Dr. Schreiner is on a different oh, side. We own that fence, bro. Like we're, we're all about the fence. <laughs> <laughs> we just we we, we want to monopolize both sides of that fence. Okay. <laughs> So, but uh, but Dr. Schreiner is uh, one of the most articulate um, arguers, or uh, I don't know, not arguers. That's a terrible word. Just cessationists at, at articulating that position. So, um, so let's jump in. Specifically, we're going to start with First Corinthians chapter thirteen. 
Uh, Dr. Schreiner, you have called this before. I have a quote from your book, a book that you guys should all read. Isn't it called Spiritual Gifts? Is just what you call it, right? Uh, yeah, uh, Spiritual Gifts, What They Are and Why They Matter. Yes. I think that's the title. A very good book. Um, so page 153, you say, If anything, Paul teaches that the spiritual gifts persist and last until the second coming in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. In fact, I think this is the best argument for spiritual gifts continuing until today. So so you think this is the best continuationist argument, uh, but it is also not compelling enough to make you a continuationist. And, and Dr. Schreiner, I apologize, because as I was reading that quote, I kind of felt like, you know, it's only four verses. I feel like we should read those four verses before you respond to explain why you think it's a good or at least the best of the continuationist arguments, but not compelling enough for you. Okay? It's so always gonna, good to read the Bible. It is we, <laughs> straight <laughs> no. from Dr. Schreiner's mouth. We need to make a meme yeah, about that. Definitely not going to be mentioned in the false, false teacher video. Okay. Right. So, so here's the verse, guys. Uh, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And then the last statement. So now faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. So, so Dr. Schreiner, back to the original question. Why is this the best argument for continuationism, but not compelling enough for you? Yeah, well, man, I could talk about this a long time, so feel free to interrupt me. Okay. I, you know, the first thing I'd say is I think the interpretation of this passage turns on the word perfect. Mm -hmm. When the perfect comes, right, the, that which is partial, that which is imperfect, uh, passes away. And of course, uh, the, the, the partial and imperfect relates to spiritual gifts there, doesn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. he mentions prophecy mm -hmm. and, and tongues and so forth. Um, well, I, maybe we should just say, you know, there are some uh, cessationists that interpret the perfect there to be the canon of Scripture. Mm -hmm. So that's a very, I'm sure you guys have talked about this a lot on your podcast, that's a very common interpretation yeah. by cessationists. So they could say when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Well, the perfect refers to the, uh, the New Testament, the completion of the canon, uh, the perfect has come, and therefore we don't need the spiritual gifts. So a lot of my friends who are cessationists would hold to that argument, but I don't think that argument's convincing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very clear in the context that the perfect is eschatological, mm -hmm. that, that the perfect refers to the second coming of, uh, of Jesus. So um, and I'm assuming it, that's correct. Do you yeah. want to talk about that at all? Yeah. Would it be fair to say that the, that, the, that the cessationists that hold the position, that this is scripture, that that's actually a, a fading position? Um, I think that there are still cessationists that hold that, but I don't know many cessationists that, that are going to that as their primary argument. Is that true? Yeah, that, that, I think that's kind of hard to know. I mean, I, uh, but it seems like it's true to me, but I wonder if in, and I'm not criticizing anyone in saying this, in more dispensational and, mm. and or fundamentalist circles, mm -hmm. this argument's pretty common. common still. I see, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I'm I, I'm not sure. Um, it's it's hard for me. I'm not in those circles, right? So, so I don't know. But I think in scholarship, I mean, it's very rare that you'd find this in a in a scholarly commentary now on First Corinthians, right? right? A mainstream well, scholarly commentary. And in in your circles at at Southern Seminary, a cessationist seminary, uh, they wouldn't articulate an argument that goes like that, that suggests that the perfect is the New Testament. They would generally agree with you on this. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, of course, I haven't polled every faculty member, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know of any faculty member who thinks the perfect refers here to the New Testament. If, if anyone does think that, I think it'd be, yeah, maybe one or two people. Okay. <laughs> at so, the most, pro but maybe none. 
Right. Yeah. But uh, but back to your point, you said you the the perfect you say can't refer in your opinion to the completion of a New Testament canon. It must be eschatological. It must refer to the second coming of Jesus. Would you would you point to the phraseology in verse twelve of face to face as a reasoning for that or a different a different part? Exactly. Exactly. And Wayne Grudem, I think, amongst others, has explained this well. I mean, the language of face to face is a a theophany, an appearance of God. And I think that appearance of God is is most naturally understood to refer to the to the second coming of Christ. I mean, the canonical view, I don't know if how much you want to talk about this, the, the, that view has a huge problems. And one of the problems is um, the Corinthians couldn't have understood this, right? Right. I mean, mm-hmm. the, Corinthians, the Corinthians had no concept of a canon. Of That's scripture. right. Right. That would that would have made no sense to them. So then Paul and 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 furthermore, I hope people don't misunderstand this. I don't think Paul had that concept either. Mm-hmm. I think Paul understood that he was writing inspired scripture, but God didn't reveal to Paul or the Corinthians that history would last for a long time. They just didn't know that. So, which which this view requires. So it's a it's an interesting thing because. Most of the people who hold this view believe in the imminence. By that, I mean the, the near coming at any time of Jesus. But, I mean, how could, you, how could Paul have held this view if he thought he was talking about the New Testament canon? That doesn't make much right. sense. Okay, so, so, so if it so does... Then I'm in, so I'm in a pickle now, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On our so, side of the fence over here, it's looking pretty good. This, this grass, <laughs> You're this making our case. The turf is pretty nice You're making our case for us. I like it. Okay, so, but... I think the obvious next question is, if this is eschatological, if these gifts such as prophecy and tongues that he mentions at the beginning of the text are going to last until the perfect comes, which is seeing Jesus face to face, is this not an argument that suggests that gifts such as prophecy and tongues will last until we see Jesus face to face? Yeah, and the, and the answer is it certainly is. I mean, it is an argument for that. That's why I say it's the best argument. You, you could make a really good case. I think a lot of people who disagree with me would disagree with me right here. And uh, again, I remember, um, I remember reading Wayne Grudem on this, and uh, yeah, he makes, a, he makes a great argument. As I've said last time, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not dogmatic on this. I, I think that but that's not to be... That view could be right. Now, I'm going to say more things in a minute, but I have great respect and honor for this reading of the text. I think a lot of people, when they hear my explanation, will think, well, that's not very persuasive. And I understand that. I'm. Um, so do you want to say, should I say my reading now? Yeah. Well, I would, I would say that uh, if we're going to be intellectually honest here, uh, you know, as continuationists, we have another problem, right? So the cessationist looks at 1 Corinthians 13, and, and their difficulty is this seems eschatological. So that's hard, and, and you're just owning that. Now on the continuationist side, we've got to own the idea that prophecy isn't scripture, and we've got to figure that out, right? So like that's in our court. So it's not like, hey, we've got 1 Corinthians 13, now there's no more problems. Uh, now we have to make an exegetical case that prophecy is subordinate to scripture and is not um, the infallible word of God, uh, in which case we would have guys like Grudem and, and Storms and these guys who would make this theological case for us, which is one that you're not convinced of. So that's really where this comes down to, right. is you've, you, we find an exegetical argument where we go, this seems like it's continued. And then there's a difficulty on, on how we interpret that moving forward. Right. So it's just, it's just nice for our audience to know this is where the debate comes, is that the continuationist and the cessationist both have a difficulty that we're trying to grapple with exegetically. Yeah. So, so just continue your thoughts there, Dr. Schroeder. Well, and, and I just want to say, just to refer our, our guests, or our, our viewers, to our previous show with Dr. Schreiner, because we talked about that very, uh, very subject extensively. So, and, uh, and there's even more, like if you guys want to, y'all can check out, uh, we've got a bunch of content online already on discipleship. Uh, you go over to theremnantradio.com forward slash blog. Dawson's got a bunch of stuff on there. And uh, if you've already checked those out, you can go to the recommended reading section in uh, the description of this video. There's tons of stuff on the gifts of the Spirit that you can kind of continue reading up on some of that stuff. But yeah. Dr. Schreiner, I don't mean to interrupt you any further. Uh, would you no, want to pick up that right. thought you had? 
Yeah, so I, I think I'd say if this is the only text I had on this issue, I would certainly think all the gifts continue today. But, but then I say, I, you know, talking about the things we talked about last time, given my definition and understanding of prophecy, given my other commitments biblically, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think when I come to this text, every doctrine has some difficult text, whether we're talking about the Trinity or justification by faith alone. I mean, whatever it is, there's always some difficult text. Mm-hmm. So if you understand what I'm going to say, there is, there is a kind of reading I don't want to be misunderstood here, happy to hear questions, but I think there is a kind of reading that ends up being kind of a simple biblicism. By, by that I mean sometimes in the history of the church, you, and I'm not accusing charismatics of this here, but I think sometimes in the history of the church, people with that kind of approach have rejected the Trinity, say, or, or any doctrinal formulations. In other in other words, when we're when we're doing when we're putting together our systematic theology, as the Westminster Confe- Confession says, we we rely on Scripture and then uh, legitimate inferences from Scripture. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. that's what it means to do uh, to do theology. So what I would say here, really, I agree with Richard Gaffin in his book Perspectives on Pentecost. Yet this this passage doesn't require. It doesn't require that the gifts last until the second coming. I, I think you could say, well, well, that's what the text says. And my, my argument would be, well, I don't, I don't think, again, could be wrong, really tough text for me. But I don't, I don't think Paul's purpose here is actually to teach definitively Yes, all these gifts last until the end. I think, I think his point in context is the gifts are limited to this age. So when he compares right in verse 11 to being a child, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. What I think he's saying is this present evil age in which we live, we're all children. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he, he's not he's not diminishing the revelation we have in this age, but the age in which we live, we're, we're children in terms of our understanding compared to the eschaton, when when we know fully. Even there, when he says we know fully, obviously that doesn't mean we know infinitely, but our knowledge of God and knowledge of truth is going to be far superior to what it is now. So I think Paul's point in this passage is actually to say to the Corinthians, don't overestimate spiritual gifts. They are wonderful, whether it's prophecy or tongues or whatever it is. But don't think they are the climax of the Christian life. No, the climax of the Christian life is when you see Jesus face to face. And and these gifts are are limited to this present present age. Could could this text be teaching yeah, they're going to last all the way till Jesus comes definitively. Yes, they could. It, this text could be saying that. But I would say one of the reasons, I don't think Paul says that definitively here, is, is because he's addressing the Corinthians in a first century context. It, in other words, it's, it wasn't God's purpose in inspiring Scripture to answer that question, that question is only answered finally from a canonical, whole Bible, biblical and systematic theology perspective. So that that'd be my read on it. Okay, so so uh, coming back to just verse ten, for instance, um, it says, "But when the perfect comes," and in context, he has said. Prophecies, they will pass away. Tongues, they will cease. Knowledge will pass away, for we know in part and prophesy in part. So these are the partial things, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that he's just mentioned. So he says, when the perfect comes, which we've agreed on is seeing Jesus face to face, the partial will pass away. What would you say if a continuationist responds by saying, 
well, but Dr. Schreiner, he doesn't leave a a vague period of time in which the gifts might, at a future unknown date, pass away. He actually uses a time word, and he says, when the perfect comes at that moment. And and if we were to kind of follow through with his argument, for instance, when he talks about faith, hope, and love, and and uh, in context, he's he's suggesting that, hey, at the eschaton, at, at Christ's return, we won't need faith and hope anymore, but we but love will continue forever and ever. And so uh, in the same way, he's using a time word, when, to suggest when the gifts will cease, and it's when the perfect comes. If a continuationist was to argue in that manner, what, what would be your response? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing I'd say is, hey, that's a great argument. <laughs> of, course, of, of course. You're, you're so you, kind, Dr. Schreiner. I I want to say you, you, you certainly may be correct in saying that, I, I mean, I want to be honest that, that I think that I, I just come back again. That certainly could be right. But, mm-hmm. but I would come back and say what I just said again and probably wouldn't persuade a person who didn't agree with me. And I'd say, you, you, you see in verse 10, when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. Paul's point, I would, I would suggest to that person Paul's point actually isn't to give a definitive word on spiritual gifts. What, what it, it includes spiritual gifts, but he's not, it isn't necessarily so that he's trying to pinpoint when all the gifts end. I think his, his point is that living in this present age, there's a partiality of our knowledge. Mm-hmm. That, and that partiality doesn't, um, doesn't end until until the eschaton could that mean those gifts as their practice would last until the end it certainly could mean that but i think it's also possible that's all i'm saying it's possible that uh the gifts do not last until the end and he's speaking more generally of partiality in verse 10. so in other words i'm i'm interpreting verse 10 not necessarily to say yes this is this is what will happen and specifically with all the gifts he's speaking more generally of partiality if that makes sense yeah it does okay so i'd like to um read a just a a quick little uh snippet from sam storm's book uh, just in regards to this subject um because uh, there are passages that say, hey, you know, I think 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, uh, that, you know, you grow in the gifts until the appearing of our Lord. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 seems that this appearing is when these gifts cease. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 is telling us to earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that we would prophesy. There are all these, all these specific passages. And Dr. Storm says this, and I just, I think this is a, a nice summation. I think of the continuationist position and why it's hard for continuationists to move off of this. Uh, he talks about like the sufficiency of scripture. He says, uh, if a cessationist undoubtedly believes that the Bible's sufficient for instruction and sufficient to provide uh, inerrant guidance for whatever we might need to grow in godliness, why does the all-sufficient Bible not say uh, what cessationists continually assert? Wouldn't it have been prudent for the apostles to have told us that the teaching uh, on their revelatory gifts would only operate for a mere 50 or 60 years of the church Uh, In my experience, cessationists who affirm the sufficiency of the Bible seem reluctant to admit that that the very Bible uh, fails to provide us with a single text in which we are told that the many uh, gifts it encourages us to pursue and practice were temporary or were characterized by some uh, inherent uh, obs... uh, (laughs) <laughs> Obs- obsolence. Sorry. Uh, he he obsolence, continues. Yeah. yeah he, he continues to talk about the sufficiency of scripture further. But I think that's that quote is probably sufficient. Um, so I just kind of toss that over to you and get your thoughts on it because, I, and obviously there are really great theologians on both sides of this debate. And I wouldn't want to say just as Doctor uh, Storms says here, uh, it's obvious that our cessationist brothers hold to the sufficiency of scripture, and we each have our difficulty when coming to these texts. But but I'd want to to know what your thoughts are on that. If the scriptures are in fact sufficient, how does a cessationist make, um, I guess, a coherent and, argument? And by sufficient, they provide everything that we need, need for, for a life, life and godliness, godliness, for salvation. Practice in right. the church, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't it be necessary for the scriptures to maintain sufficiency to tell us, hey, stop doing these things? Um, I guess that would be my question. Yeah, that's great. Well, Sam's a good friend of mine. 
I love Sam. I admire him. I think so. You know, he's a great uh, theologian and pastor for so many years. Um, but I would actually say that quote is exactly what I mean by a kind of biblicism. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, what Sam is asking Scripture to do something that I think is uh, not in accord with what Scripture, how Scripture actually works. So, you know, Sam and I totally agree. Scripture is sufficient. Scripture is inerrant. Scripture is clear. But, but you know, I, I found that quote so interesting because Sam asks, why, if, if you know, Tom, if, you're, if he were in this room, Tom, if your view is right, why doesn't the Bible say the gifts would end in 50 or 60 years? But that's, so here's, that's exactly the point I'm making. Once you say that, you're taking these letters outside the context, the historical context in which they're written, and now you're asking Paul actually to be doing systematic theology when he writes to the Corinthians. But for Paul to say that to the Corinthians would be utterly irrelevant to them. And it would also tell them that Jesus wouldn't come for 50 or 60 years. Now, the New Testament's never going to say that which is one of the reasons why I think we're not given a definitive word on this. We, 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 we never are going to have something in the Bible that says, here's what's going to happen in 50 or 60 years. Because the minute, the minute you start talking like that, you, you, you take away all those texts that say, be ready for Jesus to come soon. I mean, mm -hmm. now, now you've got 50 or 60 years and you've got some statement about what's going to happen in church history. So that's what I meant in the beginning when I said there's a kind of biblicism that requires things of the text that, um, you know, it isn't a difference in sufficiency, but it, it does require something of the text that I don't think uh, fits with how the text actually works. Uh, for us. So to me, and you know, obviously this issue is much harder, but to me that's a little bit, and they're not, I'm, I'm not saying they're exactly the same, but it's a little bit like the, you know, you get in an argument with a person, well, if the Bible believes in the Trinity, why don't we just find that word? And you know, I know I want to say that that's not, that kind of question doesn't understand how scripture is inspired. And, and then I'd say it doesn't really understand the theological task before us. So. Okay, so um, help me out, because I would agree that there are, they're like theological uh, shorthand, right, that we have in uh, today, modern day, like, for, for example, we would have the Trinity is a great one, right? Um, as the Bible talks about the Godhead, right? There's not like a verse in the Bible that talks about the Trinity. We take the sum total of the scriptures to make sense of a Christian doctrine, right? This is almost the exact opposite, though. This is actually, I mean, the cessationist position seems to be um, taking... I, I suppose sections in saying that this no longer exists. So like, is there, and, 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 and I apologize, I, I, I very well could be a biblicist and not know it. So, so you'll, you'll have to, you'll have to explain it to me maybe uh, a little bit more with, with a practice, with an operation, like, Hey guys, here's a, here's a practice. I want you guys to baptize like this. I want you to practice communion like that. If someone came along and said, Hey guys, we're not doing communion like this and we're not doing baptism like this. And we're going to, we're going to, I guess, I just don't know of another single biblical practice outside of the gifts of the Spirit that anyone argues has ceased. Um, so I guess I would, I would have a hard time making the one-to-one -one correlation between like the doctrine of the Trinity and the gifts because the, the doctrine of the Trinity is established in Scripture. It is seen in the Scripture, though the term Trinity is not seen. But the idea that the gifts have ceased is not necessarily one that I see in the totality of Scripture. Um, maybe... Am I, am I articulating that well, Michael? No, no, that's, a, I, that, that's a great point. Well, of course, yes. That's why I said the Trinity example isn't totally the best, right? Oh, okay, okay. It isn't, it isn't a perfect example. There, I don't think there is a perfect example, but, you know, you use the phrase the totality of Scripture. That's the question, right? How do we understand the totality of Scripture? Mm. I am, all I'm saying here, to put it really simply, is I don't think, you know, my basic response to Sam is Sam... Sam asks, why don't we have a verse saying the gifts would cease? Because that would mean nothing uh, that'd be totally irrelevant to the readers he wrote to. 
Mm-hmm. That's why. Yeah. That's my point. So I'm not saying I'm not saying hey that's a Sam's got a great argument you know from scriptures and uh, the continuations. I'm simply saying they can't. I don't think to require that of the text. I think is requiring something that's yeah would it, would it help us? Yes, it, it's but. But there's no way I would say that the writers are going to say that because the minute they say that, you're talking about 50 years down the road or whatever, you know, time frame you see. And that's, that is something I would just argue is in the very nature of Scripture not to do. And, 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 that's, and I would argue that's still true in our lives today. As Paul says here, we know in part. There are many things we don't know, and um, it isn't yeah. the purpose of Scripture to answer every question like that. So, I mean, I come back to where I was at the beginning. I th- that's a, this is a great argument for continuationism, but I think when you look at the framework as a whole, what the gifts actually are, um, you know, I th- maybe it would have surprised the uh, Corinthians that they're— now, maybe we don't agree on this. I don't remember, actually, but— it, maybe it surprised the Corinthians there's no more apostles. They passed from the scene. But, you know, that, was an, that wasn't a relevant question for them in the first generation. Uh, th- that is, those, there are issues from the collection of Scripture that the church has to deal with as history uh, continues. Right. So for, for clarity, um, would you say Paul was probably a continuationist and God just hadn't told him that the gifts would cease? Is that, is that That's, what you would say? Right, right. I would say it is, I think the, and I think that's true. <laughs> I'm not diminishing Paul's infallibility and inerrancy, but do I think it was revealed to Paul that the gifts would cease? I would say no. He didn't, he didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So but there, and, there, because, because the way, everything Paul wrote is inspired and true and accurate. But yeah. God, God, when he's using human vessels, he doesn't give them information mm-hmm. that they don't need to know. Okay, and I'd, I'd like for to their ask, own lives. To, to what degree does weight of evidence play into this conversation? We're talking about the quote from Sam and, uh, and just and sufficiency of Scripture. So, uh, so for instance... Um, you know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, as you know, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy, affirms essentially the same thing in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, as well as at the very end of chapter 14. And of course, we have the testimony of, of the book of Acts, which obviously is narrative, but you, you see a lot of these revelations and prophecies, as well as if we want to go beyond prophecy, healing, signs, wonders, miracles, is this sort of act outworking of Acts 1, 8. And so, uh, it, as a continuationist, I, I want to say, yes, but there's there's so much that would lead me to naturally believe if I was reading the scripture that these things would continue. I mean, I can I can point to the different verses that I just quoted and uh, referred to, and and with such a preponderance of evidence, I would need something strong to get me to say, okay, therefore, when Paul says eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy, for something to reverse that for me. And and I no. think that it's uh, I think it it's a challenge for me if it's like, well, the Apostle Paul was continuationist, but God wanted us to discern that we don't do that anymore. That so help yeah. help me to your side of the fence. And then we'll hit Ephesians well. two. I mean, I, I don't I don't think I'm gonna. I guess um, to what degree does the weight of uh, to what degree does the weight of say the other verses um, play into deciding this question of sufficiency of scripture? Yeah, well, the weight the weight of the other verses uh, that you know we're gonna uh, uh, assess that differently, aren't we? Yeah, uh, yeah. Because for me, so I I would just say in the abstract just reading the Bible, there's a sense in which we'd say, yeah, uh, sure, uh, we still have prophets today. But then then I turn to the issue we talked about last time. But wait a minute. Yeah. I think prophecy, clearly, the weight of the evidence, what Scripture says is inerrant and infallible. 
So w w I think immediately you're faced with the question, what do you do with that? Furthermore, you know, I mean, I've often been asked this question. I don't think for me, I mean, it's not satisfying to a continuationist, but to, but to eagerly seek, especially prophecy, the way I interpret 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 19, is I think Paul is teaching there, look, tongues are good. To experience the gift of tongues, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the church, he's saying corporately, is edified by revelation that comes via instruction through mm -hmm. the mind. And he gives a battery of examples to prove that, right? For sure. So, he, so I think the application for today is earnestly seek spiritual gifts, especially that you should prophesy. Earnestly seek to understand what God is communicating to you. Mm -hmm. Now, for a cessationist in me, that'd be, you know, it'd be something different. For me, finally, that is in Scripture. Right. What? Not, not that. I'm, of course, continuationists agree with that too. But obviously, they're defining prophecy differently, and so they're saying earnestly seek to have prophetic revelation in the assembly. Now, I'm not. I would not say that. But, I, but when I come to those verses, I don't say, well. Man, that was for the first century. That has nothing to say to us today. Because I think that Ephesians 2.20, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. H here I agree that the, uh, that apostolic prophetic revelation is now found in the Bible. So I think we're obeying that verse, mm. those exhortations, when we're, when we're ardently seeking to hear God's voice in the scripture. Now, and I'd immediately want to say, and we can learn from continuationists even if we don't agree with them. I mean, obviously the reformed have always believed this, but we need to remind ourselves, earnestly seeking to understand scripture, and that isn't just an intellectual activity. We need the Holy Spirit. We need, we need the, the spirit to illumine us, we cry out to the Holy Spirit to, uh, to help us. And I think, um, I mean, I've seen it in Wayne's own life. He, he earnestly seeks God's word and God's spirit. And I think there's a danger in reform circles of being too, um, sometimes being too intellectual Mm -hmm. or maybe that's not the maybe we can't be too intellectual but not not at the expense of maybe we're at the expense of the spirit word and spirit are together be filled with the spirit ephesians 5 Amen. 18 cautions 3 16 be filled with the word so you know it's it's uh it's both it's both together oh, man. that's good that's great and i would i would really encourage people dawson this would this would make cessationist and continuationist happy he wrote a blog that i published just on facebook specifically on the spirit's work in our bible reading and that's a it's a really that. important uh, subject that christians and especially my charismatic brothers because right now there, there are some kind of wheels off interpretations of way we, we read the scripture where we just read uh -huh. it and then like whatever thought pops into our mind that must be the holy spirit telling us how to read the bible uh and from a continuationist writing and just saying look we we've really got to do the exegetical legwork of this i would really encourage everyone go check that out if you have a spare moment but i'd like michael to read ephesians chapter 2 and then we'll toss it over to dr schreiner and have him begin to unpack why he thinks this is one of the, the strongest cessationist arguments uh, for the cessation of the gifts of the Spirit. Absolutely. Okay. So this is the one that Dr. Schreiner feels should be more the, the guiding sort of cornerstone, no pun intended, for our understanding of the continuance <laughs> of the gifts. So, um, oh gosh. So uh, I'll start with verse 18 to give us a little context. This is the ESV. For through him, Christ, we... Uh, Christ, we, gosh, I lost my place. We both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Okay, so why is this such an important verse for cessationism, Dr. Schreiner? Well, yeah, the first thing I'd say is, again, 
I don't think Paul, in writing this verse, is specifically thinking of the cessation of the gifts. Mm-hmm. You, what, what I'm arguing finally is uh, for a, a theological judgment that I think is derived from a careful reading of the whole canon, of mm-hmm. all of Scripture. So, but I think, of course, Scripture gives us everything we need for faith and practice, rightly interpreted. And so, I think it's very significant that Paul says the church is built on that foundation of the apostles and prophets. By the way, if people are interested, it's clear from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5, that the prophets here are the New Testament prophets. Mm-hmm. He, mm-hmm. Notice even the order. Is, yeah. you know, he, he doesn't say prophets and apostles. So I don't right. he, but Which Ephesians is different 3, from what Wayne Grudem says, right? Yeah, so... Uh, or is it Grudem or...? Yeah, yes. Wayne, Wayne, yeah, yeah, Wayne goes apostle prophets. He calls them one thing, the apostle apostles prophets. Apostles who are prophets. That's right. Yes. Okay. I th- yes. Uh, actually, I forgot that Wayne said that. I, I don't think that's convinced very many people. I'm happy to talk about it, though, if you want yeah, to. No, no, that's fine. But And then others, I guess, have made the mm-hmm. argument that it's Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles. In Which view. is also not very convincing. But you're right. No, we would agree with your interpretation based on Ephesians 3, 5, that this is New Testament apostles and prophets. And maybe right, unpack that right. for us, because again, we like there are many shades of cessationists, there are many shades of continuationist, and they might want to point to the fact that, hey, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, those are prophets of the Old Testament and apostles in the New Testament. Uh, can you just like clearly make your case that this is, this is obviously talking about New Testament era apostles and prophets? Well, I think, you know, most commentators, I shouldn't have closed my Bible, right? Um, so I need to I need to read Ephesians. Most I mean, if you're Protestant, you've got to leave it open in the pulpit. That, that's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> um, oh wait a minute! I thought I was in Ephesians, but I was in Galatians. Um, Galatians two twenty is pretty good. It's a but good Galatians three five, he says, he's talking about the mystery of Christ. This was not made known to people. The mystery in other generations. As it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Mm-hmm. I mean, virtually all commentators agree. He's talking about a revelation, a mystery that's been disclosed now in salvation history. And that's, that is Ephesians 3 5, right? I think you might have said Galatians that's, on accident. That, right. That Which, is Ephesians 3 5. And, and do you understand so, that revelation specifically to be the revelation of Jews and Gentiles becoming? one in Christ Jesus, or would you broaden it beyond that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the focus, okay. certainly. So, yeah. but I, I think mean, I might have cut six, you off. right? Right, so I think I might have cut you off, though. So I want to let you continue making your, your argument on the uh, foundational nature of Ephesians 2.20. So, I mean, just to be really simple, I mean, even our time's passing, isn't it? The, mm-hmm. That foundation, yeah. that foundation... L- which is laid by the apostles and prophets, I'd say that foundation has been laid once for all. There are no more apostles there that are giving such revelation, nor are there such prophets. The apostles and prophets function specifically to, to lay the foundation for the church in those early generations. What we need today from that apostolic and prophetic ministry is now uh, in the New Testament. That, that's not to say, sometimes I think continuationists make this mistake, maybe cessationists make this mistake as well. Clearly, the apostles and prophets said a lot of things that were true and helpful to their generation that aren't, that aren't inscripturated, mm-hmm. right? Right? Not everything that's been revealed that was helpful to the church in the first century is now inscripturated. But, but I think that that definitive foundation, we have the faith, right, uh, revealed once for all to the saints, uh, Jude mm-hmm. verse 3. Or Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, in the last of these days, God has spoken to us in his Son. So, so sc- Scripture... That is our final authority. That that authority has been vouchsafed to us through the apostolic and prophetic ministry. And so my argument is, I mean, it really takes us back to last time. Mm-hmm. My argument is, it all depends on what you mean by apostles and prophets. 
Right. You know, if you if you think if you think the prophets. So you know, I say in my book, my entrance into this whole discussion was my my understanding of prophecy. If you think prophets can make mistakes, well, then. Uh, or if you think, we talked about this a little bit last time, if you think there's more than one kind of prophet, inerrant prophets, but also errant prophets, then you're not going to find my argument very persuasive. So that's why my, my entrance into the discussion is not even through this verse, but through my definition of prophecy. But I would add to that my understanding of apostleship. What does it mean to be an apostle and a prophet? The apostles aren't continued. And there we do have at least some hints in the Bible that the, that the apostles will not continue. Again, the Bible doesn't say that definitively. But when James, you know, when James is put to death in Acts 12, he's not replaced. Mm-hmm. And that's and, and, probably something we agree on, and I think it's worth noting for those who are watching, like, again, we would look at Revelation chapter 19, and there's there's 12 pillars that have the apostles' names on them, right? So there's only, there's only 12 of the apostles, right? Uh, now, right. now you would even mention in your book that there are probably uh, less, do you call them less specific or less particular apostles, such as Barnabas, like other men who are sent ones from the church that are mentioned throughout the Bible, those who are sent that are I mean, effectively, every denomination has a missionary, which in Latin is just sent one, which is ultimately the same foundation for the word apostle. So we would all agree, um, at least the conservative continuationists that I know, there are there are certainly people in the, the New Apostolic Reformation that would go further than I'm willing to go, uh, and I think further than Scripture is willing to go. Uh, but the conservative continuationists in you, I think, agree on this, that the twelve there was only them, uh, and that there may be other less technical apostles. I think that's actually the word you use, less technical apostles who are just sent ones who are missionaries and church planters and that kind of thing. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yes. I would only add that I think, I think the technical apostles may have been wider than 12. Okay. Because, uh, but how much wider, we don't know. They were, they were probably mm. not too many, because I think Matthias was a real apostle, Acts 12. Okay, so then now with Paul, you've got 13. I think Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, that James, the half-brother of Jesus, was an apostle. Mm. James says, I did not see any other of the apostles except Except James. Except for James. That's right. And and I think James has the kind of authority, we see that in Acts 15, and and Galatians 2, because the James, uh, Peter, and John, again, that's James, the half-brother of Jesus. He has, he has the kind of authority of the other apostles, so maybe that's 14. And then, yes, Barnabas and Silas, maybe... Ish, you know, it's, apostle-ish. It's hard to know. It's hard <laughs> to know. You know, again, that's not something we have to know. I think Grudem says this as well. They're, yes, the 12, I, mean, I think the number 12 is preserved for its symbolic significance, right? The, the nucleus of the new people of God is uh is the 12 mm-hmm. which is why i think in acts one you have matthias appointed before the spirit is given so that number and it, and it comes up as you said in revelation 21 the number 12 is important but i think we make a mistake if we say well literally literally there's only 12 and no more but I, but i don't think we make a mistake to say after that first generation there's no more okay uh, yeah. Dr. Schreiner, I, I'm curious, and someone brought this up in the comments too. Uh, this is Kyle May- Maythaler. He says Ephesians. He refers to Ephesians 4:11 to 13. He says it does definitively say that apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers will continue until we all reach unity in the faith. So I think the exact wording God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and it do- and it uses that word until until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Um, would, I guess, how do you understand apostles in Ephesians 4.11, and how do you understand until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God? Yeah. Well, again, you know, we've, we've come back to the kinds of things we've talked about already. I would say, yes, the apostles and prophets ministry does continue eschatologically until we reach the unity of the faith because we have that apostolic prophetic ministry in the scriptures. Mm. 
Okay, so it, it continues so, to play out until uh, t- until the end. the the church The church is established in the unity of the faith through the apostolic prophetic ministry. There's no other uh, foundation upon which the church is ultimately uh, unified. I would argue. Right. Okay, and um, so let, let's come. I, I'm curious. So when we talk about, you know, earlier we were talking about First Corinthians 14 prophecy, which we might characterize as something like personal prophecy. Uh, we at least one of the examples that the Apostle Paul shares is the secrets of his heart are revealed, and he falls to the ground and says, "God is certainly among you." I know the last time we talked about. Um, well, I guess there's some debate over whether we call it prophecy. I was going to say that the prophecies over the Apostle Paul and whether or not to go to Jerusalem. I thought you were going to say I'm not Donald go back Trump, to and I was like, we've decided those but are prophecies. <laughs> my, my point is, um, if, if you do agree that there was such a thing as personal prophecies uh, in the New Testament, um, are you suggesting that all of those are part of the foundation of Ephesians 2.20, like every bit of prophecy was foundational for the church, or how would you understand that? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. <clears throat> Just a second. Yeah, I would say yes, yes, because I think, now I'm not saying all prophecies are inscripturated, right? Right. But I am saying, yes, they're all part of the foundation because everything God reveals to people is part of what is needed for their sanctification and their holiness. Mm-hmm. We, so we ought not to abstract, we ought not to abstract, uh, well, here's, boy, this prophecy is really important because it's about doctrine. Right. But a personal prophecy given to a person may also play a decisive role in their holiness. And so then I'd say, which I think we talked about last time, since I don't think we receive such things today, but I would say, and here's where we're pretty close, right? In this, in an analogous way, not an exact replication, but in an analogous way, God, God uses the experiences of our lives and at times impressions others have to grow us in holiness. So mm-hmm. I think that's analogous, but not exact. So okay. that makes sense. Would it, would it be, and I just want to kind of, you know, give a uh, response. So like, like the Apostle Paul, uh, and we won't use the uh, Agabus text, but we'll use the the maybe the road to Damascus, right? He has a a vision, a manifestation of Christ. It is it is uh, he is going to suffer for the gospel, and then in all the cities that he goes, he hears you're going to suffer. Now, at least those are prophecies, right? Where he's like, hey, you're going to suffer for the gospel. And to your point, those may have been necessary for his sanctification. Uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 14 would say that the gift of prophecy is for edification, for the building up of the body. So this is preparing and building up the Apostle Paul. Now, to your point, this is not foundational for all Christians everywhere, but it is intentional for the Apostle Paul to be edified and built up. And I would agree with you that like, like prophecy today, we're not creating doctrines. Like we've 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 made tons of videos about people who want to have visions of heaven that's made of jello, and a guy who's going to have thirty stuff. new practices of prayer in the courts of heaven that are completely unscriptural. And, and we would, you and I would charge, you know, that same that same kind of teaching with the same level of of intensity, right? Um, but on on the on the antithesis, I would say, look, that same kind of prophecy that was necessary for the building up and encouraging of the Apostle Paul so that he as an individual could be used for maximum yield of fruitfulness in the kingdom, uh, would that not also be for today? Like, wouldn't it also be, you know, we have scriptures that tell us, hey, live holy, live righteous, those kinds of things, but the specificity that was given to the Apostle Paul for his individual mission I were to have a dream and felt called to go to Macedonia and go pick up where Paul was per- forbidden to, right? Like, uh, if something like that were to arise, uh, would it not be at least, uh, again, from a continuationist argument, wouldn't that also be, that'd be encouraging to edify and, and build me up in the faith? Now, how would you speak into those specific today uh, w- that would say, okay, 
Um, you can't. Is, is, would your argument be that you can't separate doctrine and personal prophecy? Um, well, I guess. I guess. Where Where am I seeing that distinguishing line? That or you, you see what I'm saying? You want to pick up where I'm leaving off? No, I, I mean, I can say He's, something and then you can respond. Yeah, because I'm... I would I'm, say... I would say... Um, obviously, what you say makes perfect sense from a continuationist perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I totally understand it. But what I would say is... Yeah, I think it depends on our perspective. Yes, God could use a dream today could use a dream, could use an impression, but we, we, ought, we ought not to say those are prophecies. So it's a matter of definition, right? Those mm. are prophecies or those are definitely from God. But I, th I think a mistake that cessationists could make is, well, we don't believe in prophecy. We don't believe God is giving revelatory dreams. Therefore, therefore, God never works through some subjective means. Mm -hmm. But here, you know, here I think I agree with Jonathan Edwards. God can use impressions. I think impressions can come through dreams. But And I think, uh, we talked about this last time, and I think Edwards would say, be careful. Be careful. Uh, yes, God can use that. Don't, don't depend on that. And, and assess that. So, you know, see, we, we're, we get very close here, right? Assess that. See, most of what Grudem calls prophecy, I'd call impressions. Yeah, assess, test, consider. So, so have the congregation uh, judge. Yeah, uh. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think in a business meeting, I would say, you know, if I get up and say, this is a, a ridiculous example. I. Uh, you know, but if I say, I think we should fire the pastor, you know, um, I, you know, somebody might say that's a prophecy. I would say that's not a prophecy, but that's an impression I have. Maybe I have some arguments for right. it, whatever. And some I think the congregation vocabulary. says, you know, we don't think that's what the Lord is telling us right now. I mean, I think we can still use that language, you know? Yeah. We don't, we don't think God was actually speaking through you when you said that. I mean, I have a really dear friend who is a cessationist like me, and God used a dream, actually a dream of another person to lead him to uh, a new job. And um, he didn't think that dream was infallible, but he did believe, and I believe it too, God guided him through that dream. So... So, you know, a lot of our differences are terminological. What, mm. what does it mean when we read in the Bible prophecy? Because actually the way Storms and Grudem define prophecy is what I'd call impressions. And I think God still uses those. Yeah. So, you know, we're pretty close. We are. Practically. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> on, that, the on that. So. But, 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 you know, they would still say, look, you know, you're interpret Tom, you're interpreting the Bible wrong. That's a big right. thing, right? Oh, that's yeah. still a big thing. It's, it's still Those big. are shots. Those it's are like shots. you said in the beginning. It's good to read the Bible, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and, I think and, we. And what what is, what does the Bible mean when it uses the word prophecy? That's right. a, that's it's important. a big thing. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Hey, I, I think we got time for maybe one more question here, and I'm just gonna put my understanding of Ephesians out there, and I invite you to shoot a million holes in it, okay? That's uh, this is pretty part vulnerable, of the, Michael. Part of the fun of this conversation, right? We're just sharing our different views. So um, so I invite you to do that. But So my understanding of the, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, um, just like you said, Dr. Schreiner, we've, we've got to go to Ephesians 3.5 to help understand what this really means, where he talks about this mystery that was revealed to the apostles and prophets, and um, and that mystery is that of Gentile-Jewish union, which is such a massive theme of the book of Ephesians. Like, hey, it's no longer just Jew over here and Gentile over there, but he's reconciled the two into one. He's created the one new man. And, um, and so my understanding would be that, that specifically the way in which apostles and prophets are foundational is in the bringing of that specific revelation that continues to be foundational for the church. 
And that seems to, to me to, to fit the context better versus including personal prophecies in that, like, you, you know, some, some girl or boy has a dream and, you know, it says your sons and your daughters will prophesy and all that. Like, it, it seems as though it would be less about personal prophecy and more about that specific revelation that would be an ongoing um, foundation for the church going forward as this temple, to use that metaphor in Ephesians 2, uh, is being built up upon this one new man revelation that was made to the apostles and prophets. So, so pretty similar not, to Sam Storms? It's not, and I can't remember what Sam said so on that. I mean, Sam will say, like, ago, apostles, you know, set the foundation. That's like saying a CEO, um, you know, sets up the budget. That's not to say that a CEO yeah, can't do other things. I think what Sam says, or, if I remember right, is the fact that they were foundational doesn't mean that they don't necessarily continue also, kind of. Sure, or that that's exclusively what they did, Exclu and that there's not another kind that of there CEO weren't that other come things, after. But, okay, but I don't want to bring too many yeah, things yeah, yeah. into it. Uh, Dr. Schreiner, I know you disagree with me, and it's not going to hurt my feelings, so please feel free to respond. No, I mean, I think what you said is, yeah, I mean, it makes sense, and it's, I mean, it's clearly rooted in Ephesians. I, I think I'd say... I think the difference between us would be if, I, and maybe I don't fully understand what you're saying, right? As well, I want to say that up up front. But when when Paul is saying, you know, the Jew and Gentiles are united in Christ, I think that includes the the whole revelation of the gospel and the new covenant that he's brought. You know, in in Ephesians one nine, the mystery is that all things are united in Christ. So I think at the end of the day, what he says in Ephesians 3, we can't segregate that from Ephesians 1, uh, 9, and 10. All of salvation, salvation history is united in Christ. So I see, you know, you know a, big, a, a fundamental point of that is the unity of Jew and Gentile in Christ. But I would just want to say it, it comprehends all of his okay. gospel. So you wouldn't all limit the, it to Jew-Gentile unity, and you would say, hey, it's the summing up of all things in Christ, which includes, which includes the Jew sanctifying effect of personal prophecies and all the rest. Maybe every, something yeah, like it's, that. Every, it's everything. Okay. It's, more, it's more comprehensive. Okay, but, yeah, that's I good. Mean, Thank I you. I totally see what you're saying. Yeah, That's good. Thank you. Cool. Well, guys, we're uh, to that section of the program where... You know, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. We loved having you, but uh, we got to wrap <laughs> things up. Dr. Schreiner, I really enjoyed having you on the show today. Yeah, such it's a, always an honor. Such a treat. And I think that like having the Christian space just listen in to varying positions, treat each other with charity and respect and disagree and discuss why we believe what we believe is something that... First of all, the West doesn't get very much, but beyond that, specifically within Christendom, uh, that we have different denominations and different theological groups come together and say, hey, brothers in Christ, we agree to the essential stuff. We might actually disagree on some semantic stuff that eh, you might do church over here and we might do church over there, uh, but man, we can come together and fight the good fight together. So uh, it's an honor to have you with us today, sir. You're a, a, a gentleman and a scholar, and uh, it's always... And, and it's legitimately always, it, both. And literally both. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's infrequent that we get to give that, uh, uh, that such a title and it, and it be authentic. So uh, man, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Hey, we are entirely crowdfunded. We didn't mention this at the time of the show. Uh, but man, I really want to encourage you guys to give on Patreon if you can. In the links of the description, you can give on PayPal or there on Patreon. As low as five bucks a month, you can get access to an entire series that we've been doing on demystifying the gifts of the Spirit, specifically on the gift of prophecy. It's a really interesting video that me and Miller uh, have been working on together. We released it back in 2019, and we decided to upload it for those who give on Patreon. Also, Michael and I are going to be doing, I've already done a couple of episodes on it. Michael and I are going to be working together on doing a uh, review of of worship music and is this worship song theological uh, does it line up with what's written in scripture really interesting content that's gonna be cranked out there on patreon so i'd encourage you to check that out as well uh, but man that's it for today's show uh michael you got any other thoughts for us uh just super thankful for dr schreiner that's it excellent well we that on that we can agree uh, excellent guys thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of remnant radio and we will see you next week not next week tomorrow tomorrow for the gift stuff.
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Remnant Radio. Uh, if you like this video, we actually put together a playlist that has a whole bunch of content just like what is in this video. So I hope you enjoy. And if you got a little bit of extra spare time, maybe check out some of those other videos.